in a lot of this kind of situation, we just have to see that things may not be what they appear. Thank you. Next slide. Yeah, thank you. Now, the definition is that it is a subnormal vision when no underlying pathology can be found. It is a clinical diagnosis, and the important thing is that it is not a diagnosis of exclusion because you actually have to actively demonstrate that the vision is better than what it appears to be. The clinical suspicion happens as soon as you think, mm, something is a little bit out of place. The approach, as I said, is that you really need to show the vision is what that person claims it is. And the index of suspicion happens when the symptoms and the signs just don't marry up. So how do I approach this? I consider if a person has bilateral loss of vision or unilateral loss of vision. And remember in this symposium, uh, it's targeted to the general ophthalmologist, it's about the best office test. So a bilateral vision loss, the examination happens as soon as the person enters the room. Now I don't set up an obstacle course in my room, but I always find that it is actually quite a challenge to just you know, navigating through, and my um, examining chair for the patient has a little foot rest. It's amazing how many people trip on that, and um, the pers sometimes a person with visual loss actually can navigate without problem, and that's when sometimes I'm thinking, gee, you're pretty good. Ever since this article came out, I actually started watching out for sunglasses in my waiting room, and surprisingly, it's actually quite a good, powerful sign as well. In a dark waiting room, how many people are wearing sunglasses? <laughs> Now, let's do this for fun. Just close your eyes and try to put your two fingers together. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you. I can see the audience. We've got lots of people who are able to do that. Why? Because this is a test you do using proprioception. So you preface it to the patient. You say, oh, I wonder how is that affecting your coordination? All right, try to put your two fingers together. And can we just play that again? And so what happens is that you either get this really bizarre pass pointing, or you actually get them really, you know, hitting themselves. So, and sometimes I love the narrative, oh, it just comes, oh, I'm really trying. And uh, so it is quite an interesting exercise. And again, this is not diagnostic, but what happens in that situation <laughs> is that my index of suspicion is definitely quite high. Now, another thing is that there are some natural reflexes which are difficult to suppress, such as the OKN drum. Yes, they may be out of fashion, but I still have one of those drum, and they do still come in handy, where you can really see that fine little movement. And a lot of this is just trying to use a natural reflex. When I was a fellow with Dr. Miller, I used to think, what's that big mirror doing there? After one day I saw him suddenly bring up and the patient goes startled because it's very difficult not to look at yourself sometimes. So that's another test to actually uh, use mirror test because it's a natural reflex. What happens if it's unilateral? Well, when it's unilateral, you really need to then start thinking, are the signs and the symptoms marrying up? So let's have a look. This is a 37-year-old man, typical Australian bloke, um, after a bar fight. <laughs> He broke his glasses and uh, he presented with loss of vision in the left eye with light perception vision only. Okay. And uh, what happened was that he's got this very black looking visual field. His vision was light perception. He says, no, I can't see that. It's really dim, probably less than 5%. He identified all the plates correctly on Ishihara, but he could not even see the test plates in that left eye. But I could not find a RIB. That's where my index of suspicion started. Okay. Now, what about the uh, proprioception test? And I did that with him. I, and again, you preface it. You just say, all right, now let's just close. With your, left, with your right eye, are you able to put your finger together? He did it beautifully. And then with the, I said, okay, close your right eye now. That's your non seeing eye. And again, you get this very bizarre pass pointing. Another thing that relies on proprioception, uh, and that is the video of him doing that. But another very um, good test for proprioception is actually signature test. And again, you can close your eyes and sign. Just be careful what you sign on. <laughs> <laughs> and this is him with the right eye signing his name with no problem, but with 
with his left eye, he signed it very bizarrely. So that is another test that you can see that, aha, uh -huh, something's not adding up. They are either trying to really demonstrate something or mask something. Another test in unilateral loss of vision I found useful is actually the stereopsis test. You need two eyes to see depth perception. And what happens is that even just with the stereo tip mask test, um, the number of arcs that can, can actually convert to a visual acuity. So that's another useful test. And again, you preface it, you're not going to tell the patient that, oh, I'm going to see how your um, stereopsis is. I would say, mm, I wonder whether this has affected your depth perception. Let's just have a look at it. And you'll find that a lot of the times, uh, you know, they will either um, have no problem. And another thing you'll say is, right, so this is really new. It only happened after that bar fight, not before. Well, this is a test that you usually see if it's a pre-existing. So when you preface it, um, very interestingly, you do get very wonderful results. And some of them can get all the way down to nine out of nine circle. Another test I do is fogging test, and this is a good office test. I have a plus four and minus four cylinder. And initially, I lining up parallel to each other. When they are parallel to each other, it's effectively a planar lens. So what happens? They see it beautifully. I tend to then position myself on the side where they say they, or they allege that they cannot see. And what happens is that I actually slowly turn the um, one of the cylinders on the good eye. Why? Because when we turn on the good eye, and when it's at 90 degrees to each other, that's the image you see as I look through a plus four minus four at 90 degrees to each other. And I say to them, just keep reading down the chart. As, I, as they are reading down the chart, I'm slowly fogging the good eye. So they are actually reading out of their bad eye without realizing that. <laughs> Now, visual field. Visual field is a very important um, test, as we have heard about. But in functional visual loss, it's depending on um, algorithm, where they actually firstly put four steps in the center, and then they, it's a mathematical algorithm to start expanding. And why is that cloverleaf? Because this patient initially, they will see the line, they click. And then all of a sudden, they thought, oh, hang on, I'm not supposed to see that. <laughs> so then they stop clicking. That's why you actually get this cloverleaf pattern. Now, for a bit of fun, I put myself on a visual field one day, and I could simulate anything. I could do a bitemporal hemianopia, a quadranopia, or, or even a binasal. Okay, so it is very easy to try to trick the visual field machine. The whole thing about visual field testing, and remember, this is office test. Okay, so you and I can all do that, and you don't need fancy equipment. You just need a fixation target and a red pin. The whole thing about trying to demonstrate non-organic visual functions, we actually know a little bit more physiology than our patient, hopefully. Okay. <laughs> in, uh, in our play, um, one of the ophthalmologists jokingly said one day that if Celia decided to function on visual loss, we'll all be in trouble trying to catch her out. Okay. <laughs> and what happens is that the, in a person usually with visual field, it extends 60 degrees nasally, 70 degrees um, inferiorly, and then 90 superior and temporal. But what happens that when a person has lots of vision in one eye, they didn't know that. They didn't know you still have that 60 degree visual field. So in a person who truly has a monocular visual loss, the picture should be on your right, where you only really look at little temporal crescent. However, if they have a functional visual loss, they think, oh no, I'm not supposed to see out of my left eye. So when you do a visual field to confrontation, you see this beautiful binocular visual field that respect the vertical midline, which makes you suspicious. Okay. Now, what's another physiology? Another physiology is the visual angle. Your visual angle is a cone, so it actually doubles when the distance is doubled. So I will then do a manual visual field, and I take out the fixation target, and I'll sit one meter from there, and I'll bring my red pin in. And usually you see this constriction, and what happens is that at that point, I emphasize to them, I say, oh, I see, so it's only there. And what happens is that then I sit back at two meters from the patient. I just say, hmm, I wonder whether or not this will improve if I'm further away or whether it gets worse. And you'll be absolutely amazed how many people either go to executive same point or even narrower. 
So, but what should happen physiologically is that it should double. And again, that gives you that index of suspicion. Okay. Now, what happens when they're caught in the act? <laughs> <laughs> now, it's actually quite important not to court. And uh, um, the management, um, because if you call it, sometimes it actually becomes a little vicious cycle. Uh, when I first arrived back in Australia, uh, in my town there were quite a few patients who were labelled functional visual loss and very unhappy. Um, so I think what happens in this situation is that you need to give them a way out. And uh, you can say, I'm really pleased that from my examination finding that um, the optic nerve is good, or uh, I will say something which is true. Like the optic nerve examination is good, which shows that there's no permanent damage, and that's the way I say it. And then I'll say, which cures that say usually we would expect recovery, but what I don't know is that whether it's going to recover tomorrow or in three months' time, but you give them a way out. And uh, uh, in the pediatric forum, I always love it when uh, some of the doctors say, oh, well, in order for you to recover, you need to have a total iris and no iPad. And that seems to be a very good approach. <laughs> <coughs> and that way it gives them a way out and not surprisingly, a lot of them, the vision miraculously improves. <laughs> so in summary, for office tests for functional vision loss, it starts with history and examination and the healthy index of suspicion. I don't suspect everybody, but when things don't add up, I start thinking to myself, I need to find out if the vision is better than what it claims to be. And be careful about how visual loss, which we have just heard about with some of the, uh, with the fantastic talk from Claire about some of the retinal situations. And uh, I usually have a little slide to just distinguish what happens in BEP and ERG. But in this case, because it's office procedure, the trick is when you have that suspicion, demonstrate and do as many and as confidently as you do. If you start fumbling, that's when the patient actually realized. And similar to the fogging test, if you have never done it before and you're actually trying, as the patient start opening and closing your eye, the test is over. You might as well move on to the next one. Okay. And in functional visual loss, when you're demonstrating the eyesight, think about if it's bilateral. And from the time they walk in, start thinking, are they deliberately hitting an object? Are they actually um, able to see the chair I put in front of them? And use a proprioceptive test because that's independent to vision and that's quite useful. In unilateral, your RAPD is a very, very powerful sign because that is the one objective sign we have. You can use fogging tests and you can use visual field tests which will help to demonstrate that functional component. Thank you very much.